The fundamentalist movement is strong and it's dangerous. No doubt that some of these people who are making problems in Iraq and committing terrorist uh, atrocities are actually Saudis. This is a formula for real conflict. This is a formula for a country that is on the way to some very, very dangerous outcomes. The stability of Saudi Arabia over the long run is in fact questionable. If uh, the kingdom was, was to fall apart, it's very unlikely that uh, the United States in particular would simply stand by and let it fall apart, given its significance as an oil exporting country. We would see uh, certainly US intervention, despite you know, all the lessons and uh, the, the problems that have been associated with Iraq. One thing that many people, me included, fear is that when this happens, we will simply go and take by force of arms the oil that we need. Uh, and that will make us into a very different country and the world into a very different world. We're looking at essentially a generation-long, multi-generational resource wars. Ultimately, there really are only two options. One is to militarize the taking of oil, which means to get your population to understand that if they want to continue to drive SUVs and have the cars and consume energy in the way they are, that they will be in war after war. The other position is to begin to prepare for what we all see coming, which is an end to the era of cheap oil, um, and to uh, invest in alternative technologies for energy that are cleaner, safer, and have less detrimental effects on the political and social makeup of oil exporting countries themselves. For a century, we didn't spend a nanosecond actually really taxing ourselves as to could we ever actually come up with a replacement for oil and natural gas. Bəşəriyyət insan zəkası o qədər böyükdür ki və tükənməzdir ki, o insan zəkası o qədər inkişaf edəcək ki, o neftin vəzində mütləq nəsə bir alternativ bir şey tapılacaq, nəzə imsə, yanacaq mənbəyi deyimi, ya qida mənbəyi kimi tapılacaq və mən buna arxayla. The Stone Age ended not because we ran out of stones. We moved from the horse to the automobile, not because we ran out of hay. I don't dismiss the ingenuity of man. The step that we're embarking on today is the hybrid electric automobile, which has both a, uh, an internal combustion engine and an electric motor. I drive a Prius car. It gets 45 miles per gallon. If gas were $10 a gallon, I can still fill the tank and go 500 miles on it, and that's not too bad. Well, even if you wave the magic wand and hybridize every car on the road right now, we'd still be consuming the same amount of gasoline that we are now in about five or seven years. Because again, with each passing year, the economy grows and we have to consume more and more oil. We have very big challenges to face in this century. This is a planet that has six billion people on it now, perhaps nine billion people by the end of the century. The problem is e enormous. 14 terawatts of energy we need by 2050. We need a new source of that much energy. 
That's equivalent to 220 million barrels of oil per day. We've got 700 million internal combustion engines running around the, the roads of the world. Again, we're, we're talking about the scale and we're thinking about so what does it take to really replace fossil fuels for transportation. The big one, of course, which is hydrogen, that's the one that's going to do the trick and, and replace oil eventually. Well, the hydrogen economy is um, conceptually a good idea. If you look in reality, it has major challenges. The problem also for industry um, is, is sort of a chicken and egg thing. Um, industry is reluctant to, to really invest heavily into fuel cell technology because there is no hydrogen infrastructure to deliver and produce cheaply hydrogen. On the other hand, this infrastructure is not in place because there is no demand for hydrogen. So how do you get this started? And, and both, again, need substantial breakthroughs in technology. Um, fuel cell technology, hydrogen production uh, technology, uh, transportation of hydrogen and storage of hydrogen are fundamentally unresolved issues. The economics right now are that we uh, use the equivalent of three to six gallons of gasoline to make enough hydrogen to drive a car the same distance that one gallon of gasoline would drive it. So the hydrogen economy at this point makes no sense. If you talk about hydrogen, it may take at least 40 years. Uh, easily 30 to 50 years. Easily. The principal drawback to biomass is that it's generally pretty inefficient. A couple of pretty respected scientists in our country believe that if you look at all of the energy inputs into producing ethanol, you put more fossil fuel into producing the ethanol than the energy you get out. The quantities that it could be made available from ethanol and biodiesel are very, very small and would replace only a small percentage of the fuels that we consume today. Even if you took the biodiesel production, scaled it up to the maximum, and then scaled that up another 10 times, you're still talking about a drop in the bucket compared to what we get from oil. How much of our food acreage are we gonna to convert to growing uh, fuel uh, how much ca world hunger can we stand if that's the fuel of choice? Nuclear energy will be expensive and the experience that we have gathered over the last 20, 30, 40 years in terms of safe storage of, of materials, especially in Europe, um, where there's much more discussion about uh, how to treat the waste and, and what to do with that. This needs to be rethought. People are nervous about the, the risk of an explosion or a, a nuclear event of some sort, and then there's a the danger of uh, terrorist activity. If you wanted to build enough to replace all the fossil fuel that we burn worldwide today, which is 10 terawatts, you would have to build 10,000, 10,000 of the biggest possible nuclear plants. And if you did that, uh, and burn U-235 in them, the worldwide reserves of uranium will be exhausted in somewhere between one and two decades. So it, it would be a, a bridge at best. Wind energy is becoming more popular uh, and ec economically viable, but because of its intermittency and low power density, uh, it will ne never contribute more than a small fraction of our uh, energy supply. When you talk about wind or s solar energy, or whatever, these are very small. Can we? Oh, we are. I see it's starting. Uh, can we uh, turn that on a little bit more?
Oh, yeah. There it comes. Okay. So here, this is actually an artificial light. In sunshine, this does the same thing. And so this little machine is converting light directly into electric power. It'll convert 10 or 12 percent of sunlight directly into electric power. And we do have the technology to we know how to do We have the technology this. right now. We know how to do it. Yes, so, uh, we don't build these big power plants tomorrow morning, but we know how. It takes a lot of development of equipment and so on. Uh, but we know how to do it now. The total amount of sunlight that falls on the planet is 20,000 times the amount of fossil fuel power we're using now. So we are awash in sunlight. There's plenty of energy from sunlight. We just haven't begun to learn how to use it properly. The real barrier to implementing solar electricity now is its cost. To generate the, the same amount of power we now use in fossil fuel, you'd have to cover a land area roughly half the size of the state of California. All of the solar cells made in the world up to now probably would only cover about 10 square kilometers. It's a tiny fraction of it, so uh, not impossible, not unthinkable, but really a huge technological challenge. We've got to look at all of these sources of energy and if you add them all together, you must be very optimistic about each of these sources to believe that we can produce anything like the uh, quantity and quality of energy that we're getting from fossil fuels. Our worldwide demand now is somewhere between 25 and 30 billion barrels a year, and it's increasing at a, an alarming rate. Uh, and that's really where the problem is. The, the demand is so huge, there is nothing that we can imagine to replace oil in those quantities. There are lots of ideas around, and the ideas are just vapor until somebody actually tries them and shows that they either work or, uh, and have side effects or don't have side effects or don't work or whatever. That's called research, and that's exactly what we're not doing. You can't undo uh, where you are, so yeah, evolution is always forwards. We're never going backwards, so we, we will never be back to the farm and because the evolution just went in a different way. So we, we basically just have to adapt to the new conditions. It's very unlikely that once we've run down the other side of Hubbard's Peak, that we're going to be able to maintain the kind of lifestyles that we're now maintaining. This oil is so cheap. It's so readily available. There was just such an enormous temptation to exploit this and to set up a quality of lifestyle that it will be impossible to maintain. There's something about a horse that has an appeal that the automobile doesn't. I mean, the horse is a living thing and it's oftentimes between an owner and a, and a horse uh, a certain amount of affection develops. We're going about nine miles an hour right now. We had a kind of a dry run, a trial run for what, what would happen when oil peaks. No gas. No gas today. No. There was a temporary peak in 1973. Right. Uh, Middle Eastern OPEC countries were angry about the 1973 war in Israel, uh, and they embargoed the, the oil. And we immediately had panic for the future of our way of life and mile-long lines at gas stations. <laughs> 